Okay, the numbers seem to have settled down. I think we'll make a start. Welcome to this online seminar with George Davies Smith. Thanks for joining us. I'm obliged to tell you that this whole event is being recorded, including the Q&A at the end, and it will be available later on the website. My name is Michael Blastland. I'm a journalist. And when George asked if I'd be willing to do this, I thought I'd pay to do this. And um, the reasons in that old line about standing on the shoulders of giants, corny as it is, George has a habit of pointing out when many have forgotten or never knew whose shoulders we are or should be standing on. Uh, I think he has a particular eye for shoulders we've somehow neglected and for their significance. So when at his suggestion, I ventured into the book, uh, Experimental Epidemiology by M. Greenwood, etc., as it says on the title page. One parallel that leapt out for me was with the statistician Stephen Sen's challenges to the hot topic of personalized medicine. How dependably can we isolate individual characteristics as the cause of response and non response? These old timers. And by the way, could they write? So when it feels as COVID makes us feel that research needs to reach as high and fast as research can, I think George's ability to know where to stand to put history to constructive use now is priceless. And seeing as he's a tall bloke in his own right, the result, well. George, as everyone will know, is professor at the MRC Integrative Epidemiology Unit at Bristol. We also have two distinguished discussants, Peter Arby, recognized for his work on the Bandim Health Project and non-specific effects of vaccines, and Art Rheingold, professor of epidemiology at the Berkeley School of Public Health. The talk is titled Experimental Epidemiology and Beyond Historical Considerations of Individual and Population Immunity in the Age of COVID-19. Not a title for the tabloids exactly, George, but a history I think we're all about to know, to wish we'd known and understood earlier. Take it away, George. Great, thanks. I'm just going to do my screen share. I, uh... That's it. Great. Sorry. Right. Uh, right. So I'm uh, going to talk about the uh, about experimental epidemiology. This is the first of uh, two seminars. The uh, uh, called under the general title uh, of shoe leather and bootstrap epidemiology, which is thinking of the two types of epidemiology that one can have during situations uh, such as uh, pandemics. And this is very much the shoe leather side. This is uh, people collecting data, even collecting data in, uh, uh, in the mouse studies involved a lot of shoe leather. Uh, and then uh, the second one will be on the models, uh, 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 epidemic models. Uh, so the outline of this, of this talk is I'm gonna say, I'm going to talk a bit about why experimental epidemiology emerged and then uh, what it was and what were its aims, how they arranged the studies, and then I'm going to relate it to uh, human studies that were going on uh, by carried out by cognate groups at the same time. And then I'm going to say why it disappeared. And I'm then going to, I'm going to finish by talking about the key concepts that actually came out from that uh, work. Uh, and then to leave to the discussion uh, if there are any implications uh, for today. So to uh, give the setting of when experimental epidemiology emerged, uh, we're going to look at the pre-experimental epidemiology period. And this was the post-germ um, years of success. So Pasteur and Koch and colleagues identifying the infectious agents which underlie uh, important uh, diseases was obvious, uh, obviously uh, a, a, a pestilent break in how to think about uh, disease and how to prevent it. And there were, you know, there were many apparent successes, both through applying uh, hygiene, hygiene conditions, standard public health work, also through the development of uh, vaccinations. And the sort of failures, sorry, this should say 1892, not 1982. The uh, failures uh, were informative, such as the cholera outbreak in Hamburg in uh, 1892, uh, which was uh, seen to be uh, terribly 
mismanaged. It was um, during this year, uh, 1892, that the leading hygienist of the day, uh, Pettenkoffer, um, famously performed his uh, stunt of uh, drinking uh, diluted excreta from a cholera patient uh, in his attempts to demonstrate the, that the, the germ, the bug was not all that mattered uh, in disease. And uh, he got some sort of mild uh, diarrhea, but uh, nothing worse, but possibly uh, worse for Pettenkoffer was the sort of collapse uh, of his uh, sort of uh, worldview and he uh, committed suicide in uh, 1901. But, and, and I'm going to uh, say very briefly what the characters that I'm going to uh, talk about who contributed to the development of experimental um, epidemiology were doing uh, during this time. The person uh, who is key uh, to this work in the UK context was Major Greenwood. He was a son of a GP. He was medically qualified, but did very little medical work. And he went to study with uh, Carl Pearson, where he developed uh, his uh, interest, obviously, he furthered his interest in medical statistics and became uh, one of the uh, um, formative uh, um, uh, uh, contributors uh, to medical statistics and the first professor of epidemiology and medical statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. During this period, Greenwood was uh, studying plague in uh, India and uh, looking at uh, epidemiological factors such as proximity to railways. He was also starting to develop uh, his interest in disease models and how to look at factors influencing rise and degree of severity of epidemic diseases. And he uh, carried out what are in a way sorts of meta-analyses uh, of studies of anti-typhoid and anti-cholera inoculation. And uh, anti-typhoid um, uh, inoculation uh, played a key role in the uh, First World War uh, when this was considered to have very substantially reduced the deaths from typhoid, which were, um, were, which were huge during the Boer War. So um, the, the, and Greenland was working in this way. Claire uh, Oswald uh, Stalibras, uh, who was a um, public health doctor in uh, Liverpool. He was the, uh, the ports uh, uh, doctor, uh, a medical officer at this time. He wrote a 700 page uh, tome uh, called The Principles of Epidemiology in 1931, which was is the first uh, textbook and as we would re now recognize it of um, epidemiology. It's entirely concentrated on infectious disease uh, epidemiology in its uh, 700 pages, but it was it uh, integrated both the uh, experimental epidemiology work, which it reviewed, and uh, clinical work, and looking at the public health uh, implications of these. And at that time, he was looking at uh, how um, public health interventions had led to successful reductions in typhoid fever in Liverpool. This is a 1912 paper. Uh, Sheldon uh, uh, Dudley, uh, who was the prime contributor to studies of uh, immunity in uh, humans, especially in, uh, in many populations, but uh, at uh, the Royal Hospital School in Greenwich. Uh, he was in the uh, Navy and uh, saw service uh, during the First World War, but before this, he was uh, beginning to write about, uh, uh, about uh, 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 treatments uh, of infectious disease and uh, uh, um, infectious disease epidemiology. Arthur Newsom, uh, who uh, was the uh, uh, principal, he, he became the uh, principal medical officer for the uh, local government board, which was basically the uh, most important uh, public health job at the time from 1908 till its uh, abolition in, um, in um, 1919. Uh, he was uh, working on uh, public health programs in, uh, in general, but uh, very much uh, applying uh, sanitary rules, but san san sanitary rules informed by reductions in infection. And Greenwood in 1916 um, saw that uh, epidemiology was, was going to reach uh, its 
uh, could reach new heights through a combination with math mathematics, saying that epidemiology needed to be extracted from its present humiliating position as the plaything of bacteriologists and public health officials. And that the work of Sir Ronald Ross, who was developing, uh, obviously was working on malaria and during his work on malaria, um, started developing um, um, his, uh, his models uh, of uh, happenings, as he uh, called them. And then the very different uh, figure of uh, John Brownlee, who became the first uh, statistician at the uh, Medical Research uh, Council in its days before it was called uh, the Council. Uh, he was uh, developing um, epidemic curves for disease, uh, disease, uh, all uh, diseases. Uh, I mean, that, uh, Brownlee, uh, his sort of role uh, in, the, in, in this story was that uh, Brownlee was committed to the view that single epidemics rose and fell because of a change of the nature uh, of the infectious agent. So the reason, the reason why uh, epidemics would begin to fall was because he thought that the infectious agent, the properties of the infectious agent were changing to make it uh, less, um, less virulent. Uh, and that that was the reason for the, fall, uh, for the decline. And that came into conflict with views that the decline was due to changing levels of susceptibility uh, in the population uh, in many cases. But anyway, maths was going to elevate epidemiology to the rank of a, dis of a distinct science. So um, in, uh, experimental epidemiology is generally referred to as being an sort of, uh, in interwar phenomenon, because it did sort of run from um, around the time of the First World War uh, to around the time of the Second World War. But I'll, I'll suggest that, in fact, the, uh, the occurrence which stimulated the developments of, uh, in, of the, uh, experimental epidemiology was the Spanish flu, only called Sp the Spanish flu, of course, because Spain was neutral in World War I and uh, the Spanish press wasn't uh, censored. Unlike the press is in other countries around 1918, it might, it might properly be called the Kansas flu if that wasn't the case. Uh, or there's uh, other, uh, uh, other suggestions of uh, its origin. So, um, uh, so, so obviously this was an event of um, major importance. It was called American's Forgotten Pandemic in uh, Crosby's book. And, but uh, over the last uh, sort of year and a quarter, you'd be a year and a bit, you'd find it rather difficult not to have um, heard of the Spanish flu. And the figure at the top is the uh, uh, crude death rate uh, from infectious disease in the US uh, uh, over that period. So, and the, the, the um, Spanish flu has definitely had, an, uh, and the Second World War uh, had influences on the people who contributed to the development of, um, of experimental epidemiology. The uh, key uh, uh, contributor, the bacteriologist, William Topley, the key contributor with Greenwood, uh, served in the Near East and from Greenwood's uh, Royal Society uh, biographical memoir of, of Topley. He says that how um, Topley, being an eyewitness to a catastrophic epidemic of typhus, directed his thoughts to the study of epidemiology, but he was led by looking at what epidemiology was producing at the time. Uh, he was led to the conclusion that the orthodox epidemiology was little better than a blend of folklore and mythology only to be transformed into a science um, by turning it into a branch of experimental biology. So um, uh, this, that, that, that period, obviously, many people reacted in different ways. T.S. Eliot, by writing, by writing The Wasteland, where he said that these fragments I've shored up against my ruins, or the fragments being a poem in a way, uh, so maybe experimental epidemiology was the, uh, the equivalent response to Eliot's production of the wasteland. Uh, uh, Fred Neufield, director of the Robert Koch Institute and the person who set up probably the third biggest experimental epidemiology uh, program uh, in the world. Um, uh, he, he said how the uh, Spanish flu, the experience of the Spanish flu and, how, and the sort of helplessness of public health in the, in the face of the Spanish flu had sort of changed thinking. And he, uh, he said that those involved in infectious disease control 
should give up at last on the notion that it's their duty to track every last bacillus or in typhus every last louse into the, its remotest nook and cranny and to kill it. So, the, uh, so this was uh, you know, suggesting that uh, uh, maybe there needed to be new ways of uh, thinking uh, about, um, uh, about infection. And um, uh, uh, Greenwood and uh, uh, Arthur Newsom. So Arthur Newsom was by far the most important public health uh, doctor at the time. And Greenwood, they contributed, uh, or uh, Newsom organized a, a sort of hundred page symposium on um, the influenza in 1919, which is a remarkable document. It's in the uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, when, when basically there's a, a sort of discussion about how, uh, what was thought the, the public health could do. Uh, uh, it's rather limited abilities to do anything uh, uh, in that situation. And sim similarly, Greenwood was discussing the uh, uh, limits of epidemiology in understanding um, such outbreaks. So from being this, uh, this uh, what uh, Topley had called a mixture of, uh, this mixture of, of, of uh, folklore uh, and mythology uh, was put onto experimental feet. So rather than start with humans, where it was realized that it's incredibly difficult or if not impossible to have sort of controlled uh, situations and controlled uh, uh, studies where you can control every factor and just use observation in, in naturalistic settings, that the requirement uh, was one of experimental rigor. And um, three large groups were set up. I'm going to um, concentrate uh, on the UK group, which was um, began in Topley, it was in Manchester, but then became uh, with Greenwood and uh, others, at the MRC and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The, uh, in the US, there was a, a similar uh, huge enterprise, uh, Simon, that was run by Simon Flexner, sorry, spot wrong, and uh, uh, Leslie Webster, uh, uh, carrying out really rather very similar uh, uh, studies. So I'm not actually going to talk much about uh, the US work and uh, hardly at all about the Robert Koch Institute work, but these, these uh, studies were following on the same lines. And later there was uh, under uh, McFarlane Burnett, later the, won the Nobel Prize for his work in immunology, uh, there, was the, um, there was work in Australia, which was really work that, ca that carried on and, and uh, finished uh, a few years after the Second World War. But that was the major, those are the major groups carrying out experimental epidemiology. Uh, writing the, uh, the book that, uh, or the report, which is there, which, um, uh, uh, which Michael uh, kindly, uh, which Michael mentioned, uh, was uh, uh, Greenwood, and then the young statistician, youngish statistician, uh, Austin Bradford Hill, who had uh, not um, um, been engaged in the First World War and could not become a doctor because he developed tuberculosis, which is what he wanted to do, so went into medical statistics. Uh, and um, uh, WWC Topley, who was the uh, bacteriologist uh, who I uh, introduced earlier. And then uh, there's G.S. Wilson, uh, who was uh, head of the uh, public health laboratories uh, in the UK. Uh, were the were the main uh, were the major main contributors, and the uh, model they were starting with, uh, what would be a familiar one uh, to today, was which they had to consider um, the bugs. This was the uh, agent, and that maybe the focus of bacteriologists, uh, who Greenwood and uh, uh, Newsom and others saw as sort of taking over. Uh, what should be um, public health and epidemiological work, with their focus was very, very understandably on the bug, uh, on the agent. And, and, and Brownlee's uh, approach, which was thinking that epidemics were uh, driven by changes in the, in the uh, biological characteristics of the, of the bugs, uh, might also lead to uh, this approach, although we looked at other factors that might um, influence uh, in infection. 
including in the environment where Brownlee looked at uh, seasonality, although his periodicities that he saw in diseases tended not to uh, be stuck to that. But then from the public health perspective, the, the, obviously the environment was, is, most, is, is key, but, but the environment being something which uh, leads to uh, how the hosts or the humans uh, contact uh, the agent. And so fine, and from, from the host's perspective, their contribution is both, both the biological susceptibility, uh, which could be influenced by innate and non-innate uh, factors and behaviours which might uh, lead to greater exposure. Uh, in um, uh, Stalibros' terms, he, he referred to this as the seed, the soil uh, and the sower the environment being what, uh, what uh, 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 sowed the, the seeds of disease uh, uh, onto the host. So these studies that were set up and those probably half a million mice were sacrificed uh, across the world in experimental epidemiology studies in, the, in Britain, probably 200,000. Uh, 200, um, so these were uh, huge um, enterprises. Uh, and th uh, there was, um, there could be, uh, there's a, a large number of things were investigated but I'm just going to talk about the um, general uh, designs of the sort of four studies, which had four study designs, which were used a lot in the UK and the US uh, and the German programs. Now, the first, uh, so, so these, these studies were in, obviously, uh, were in enclosed uh, uh, and housed, i.e. Uh, indoors uh, settings. The mice would be caged, the size of the cages and the numbers of mice that would be together would be one, one factor uh, that would be um, altered. But their purpose was to set up a situation where maximum control could be, uh, could be ensured over the experimental setting. Uh, and these cages, uh, because of worries about environmental transmission, i.e. factors in, in uh, factors of the environment that were, was, were remaining as sources of infection, that they might sort of disturb the, the um, experimental aim, which was to look at the sort of interactions of the, uh, of the mice um, uh, and how disease was transmitted uh, between, uh, between, between mice uh, directly. Um, these cages were boiled every day so they'd be taken and they'd be, the mice would be removed and, and then the, the cages would be sterilized and there'd be a sort of, uh, um, there'd be a production line so that there'd be a, there'd be a new sterilized ca cage would be ready when you were taking the mice out of, uh, uh, out of one and putting them in another. And this was done uh, being England in uh, 1919. Uh, this was done on six days a week, but not on Sundays. So on Sundays, the mice were, that would actually stay in the same, they'd stay in the same cages for that length of time. But that, um, that, that is, just, is just one, one component of the degree to which the control, they tried to control the experimental uh, situation. So the, the, the uh, first studies were set up were to, uh, were to, were to, were to examine uh, uh, how mice just did in this in these settings, and so you'd start we'd start with uninfected mice, and then because mice die um, and, uh, at a reasonable rate, uh, you'll be replacing you'd be putting in uh, uh, susceptible mice, so you'd, be, you'd no infection would be uh, introduced, and then so one of the sort of first um, observations was that when they, when they repeated the control, just the control study, they were, think they, they were getting the same uh, sorts of mice. Uh, they'd be carrying, these would be being carried out in the same uh, sorts of experimental, um, in experimental settings. Uh, but there was a lot, quite a lot of variation. There was variation that sort of couldn't be explained uh, in the uh, death, in the death rates in the mice. But these gave the, sort. but these gave the, uh, the, the, you know, the baseline for looking at what happened 
and experimental situations. So then in the, um, uh, in the first experimental uh, situation beyond the control, they would, uh, uh, after a running period, uh, in, and infected mice, a certain, certain number of infected mice would be added, added to the uh, colony. And then the inspect, infection would spread and uh, the uh, number of little mouse coffins uh, would, uh, would increase. Uh, but the but, but, um, uh, susceptible mice were replaced, were constantly uh, put in at a set numbers. And one of the experimental things which varied was how rapidly you put in uh, susceptible mice, the numbers you put in, uh, uh, etc. And then this would um, uh, be, be, you know, these would these susceptible mice would be uh, replacing the, um, the the dead mice. Uh, and in the later discussions, uh, the with the human uh, analogies which are being drawn all the time, the analogy uh, here was with uh, new was 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 with births in human groups. So it was, it was thought, uh, it was already um, uh, being thought during the 1920s, 1940s period, uh, the thinking of the, the human work, as I say, went along with uh, how the thinking changed in experimental epidemiology setting, but they were thinking of this uh, in, in the sorts of ways that would, in, uh, that these uh, introduction susceptibles uh, would, would uh, allow uh, the uh, infectious agent to find uh, new, uh, new hosts and not to uh, die out. So in the way that uh, births uh, was, it was begun to be thought that uh, um, the newborns and uh, young children provided the numbers of susceptibles required for you know, an, a, another measles outbreak and the, why the periodicity of a couple of years might be being seen. The, um, Third experiment uh, was um, uh, in, in a mixed infected and susceptible uh, mouse colony. You would regularly add susceptible mice, but then also you would add mice with prior exposure to the infection. So you'd, you'd have several of these studies, as I say, 200,000 uh, mice, you would have several of these studies uh, running together with the same infections. And then you and you would take then mice with 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 the who who had been exposed and had survived for long enough in one setting. You would take them and and put them add them into your experimental uh, setting, and then you would look to see uh, how well the previously exposed uh, mice uh, and the susceptible mice um, fared, and what was uh, generally was found was that the uh, prior exposed mice would uh, do better. And so this was uh, thinking about the notion of how the immunity uh, generated uh, by um, exposure, but, but, but in mice who sometimes would not have ever appeared ill, um, but, that, but the, that immunity, um, uh, uh, how, how it played out. And they would look both for specific immunity so they would look they would move mice who, who had the same from colonies with the same infection and to, but also look to see whether there's any cross protection of different infections against um, uh, other infections and then uh, finally although I'll say these, these are it's, it's difficult to extract the, the, these are the sort of the key or core um, uh, study forms that I could see uh, uh, a fourth type, the uh, infected mice would be introduced uh, uh, with the uh, susceptible mice at the beginning, and then you would replace with susceptible mice, but then also with vaccinated mice. And so this would be to study the protection uh, offered by um, vaccination. And there was, uh, um, again, you would look at specific and uh, whether there are any general effects and also the effects of the specific vaccination to the bug in question. And um, um, again, there was some there were hybrids of, uh, of, of this. So 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 these these uh, studies were run. There were there were many uh, different uh, infections were used. Uh, the longest running one I think was about eight years. That so it would continuously run for eight years by replacing the susceptibles. You would uh, you would mean you would you would get you know continuous increases and decreases 
would often be seen in infections, although um, you know, many times um, things went, to, went wrong. And there was, they, they mainly, they studied many bacterial infections, the names of these has changed, the top one is mouse typhoid. Um, but um, I'm gonna talk a little a bit about the ectromelia, which was the uh, mouse pox virus um, in, uh, infection, and which actually become, is, is a big focus of the final uh, report. As it, it, that was work they started doing. Uh, uh, towards the uh, the end, but as I say, they also studied you know, cross protection, etc. Uh, if there was any between all of these infections. And then before I get before I get it, I'm going to discuss the concepts they came up with uh, at, uh, at the end. But the the sort of the major uh, findings uh, um, which were, were expressed clearly in their reports. First, it was the very large interstudy variation, even when you were trying to control the, situ the situation, so they couldn't um, actually uh, explain. Uh, the second was the, especially with uh, ECTV, the viral infection, um, was the, the difficulty of uh, control. There's a section in the report where they discuss <laughs> called the very unfortunate history of the controls. And this was uh, in, with the ECTV, uh, one of the ECTV studies. Uh, that, that however, uh, however they uh, they tried to keep the environments uh, clean and separate, including by uh, uh, completely glass, uh, uh, separating them by by glass and gauze. Um, uh, that the controls who had no infectious infected mice introduced, as uh, sometimes the whole whole colony would be wiped out. Or, or um, a large proportion of it. Um, so it would so it's sort of you know um, uh, having having border controls is quite difficult in these places, and the, and the controls uh, uh, often um, uh, uh, fail to survive. They addressing uh, what now is sort of quite a, you know coming to it now. You read this and you think. It's just huge amounts of the discussion was about this, uh, but but was the was the fact that they thought that there was, there was generally a constant strain within epidemics. Uh, so that they so but, and the, the reason why this was so was, was focused on so much was because of the sort of influence of Brownlee, especially on Greenwood, uh, uh, and. Um, uh, the notion that actually it, what, epidemics were driven by changes in, in the characteristics of the germ. So they came down very strongly that the characteristics of the germ were not changing, although occasionally there, there would be changes, you know, changes um, uh, you know, from one epidemic to a, a, lot, a lot fair time later. But, the, but the general, generally they, the, the, the uh, epidemic shape that was driven by many things they couldn't measure. But what they thought that they could measure was important was the level of immunity uh, uh, of the mice, which they were clearly the experiments were set up to look at. They found for ECTV that attenuated live virus immunization was protective and really highly protective. Um, so this is attenuated you know, virus, uh, but that the animals can uh, carry virus, they can, uh, they can shed their live virus, which, is, which was from the uh, immunization, and that could lead to infections. But also, uh, they were then introduced, if the, if the uh, immunized mice were introduced into another colony, uh, they would not get ill, they would get, they, uh, after they've been immunized, uh, but they could spread the virus. And they also found that that was the same for the mice which had survived. The ectromedia killed a high proportion of the mice. Uh, but those the mice who, who survived, or sometimes the mice who seemed to be in a colony for a long period of time and not actually get sick, were in one colony when they're put into another, they appeared protective. But they they were shed, they were um, could, well, they could uh, uh, communicate uh, disease, and so they, the the uh, what they they, they uh, thought of the measured factors that, uh, or the factors they um, thought they could they could measure. Uh, the, the role of uh, the immunity of the individual mice, but then the collective immunity uh, of the um, of the group. 
uh, were, the, were the important factors. Uh, Greenwood uh, at Al, they did, one thing they, they did discuss was they discussed the extent of, that the level of control uh, that they were implying. And they said, of course, you know, our, you know, this study uh, can say nothing about how um, you know, mice would be in the wild. And in this, this sort of relates to, uh, to many areas of biology. Uh, for example, uh, uh, this paper was looking on the uh, immunology of wild and laboratory mice, and look, also began to look at genetic influences on that, and showing that, that these things were just were, uh, information from one just was just not applicable to the other. So laboratory mice are not a good model for wild mice, let alone humans. And uh, uh, the Greenwood certainly just uh, uh, discovered uh, discussed that. Greenwood also uh, uh, discussed uh, something which I've uh, referred to as the gloomy prospect, um, which is that a large proportion of what drives, um, for example, uh, development of disease at the individual level uh, are things that you can't possibly uh, hope to measure uh, and that you might as well uh, call a chance. So that they, they, in this sort of very controlled situation, bring, he has this rather beautiful passage where he starts, dis, you know, he starts discussing the actual, you know, the interactions between any particular pairs of mice and what might be going on at that particular uh, time, and the temperature that uh, might go up a bit, even its controlled temperature setting, etc. All these different things could happen, and that you know you, you couldn't even hope to, you couldn't even hope to measure that, and so you have to take that as uh, as being um, uh, as being how the world uh, uh, works, and. The, the, the final conclusion uh, made was about what is the actual level of study. So how that you are studying. So epidemiology works uh, basically by aggregation. So if you've got some smoking mice and uh, non-smoking mice here, even for even for the sort of the um, you know the, the sort of strongest largest common effect risk factor there is. Um, uh, cigarette smoking, uh, you know, at, a, at an individual level, the so pseudo variance of uh, cigarette smoking for lung cancer is well less than less than ten percent. But, um, but then, if you aggregate groups, which is what you're actually doing, if you study how smokers do versus uh, non-smokers do, uh, that aggregation allows you uh, uh, allows you to identify um, large and reliable differences. Such that if you put if you put um, uh, if, you, if you have two populations where there's very uh, very considerable smoking differences, like uh, men and women after the Second World War, after the First World War, when men had taken up smoking, women hadn't in Britain, uh, the smoking uh, would explain a, a vast proportion of the uh, difference in rates between groups. So you've got to make that uh, aggregation to be able to make any inference. But what Greenwood uh, uh, noted was that when you're looking at uh, epidemics, you needed a higher level of aggregation because your, your lower level, you think of these individual smoking mice, that was actually your, your colony, each colony where you were looking at separate uh, uh, epidemic uh, characteristics. If you were actually trying to say something about the characteristics of the epidemic, you were having to do the analyses at the group level. And in his uh, very moving and uh, Brilliantly written uh, obituary, uh, Royal Society obituary of Topley. He says, uh, he says, you know, well, you know, we sacrificed uh, a couple of hundred thousand mice, but the actual number of comparisons we could make was uh, was orders of magnitude smaller because you could, because the, the unit of analysis was the um, uh, was was the single uh, epidemic. Which made explanation um, uh, difficult and explanation uh, often a post hoc explanation, um, um, particularly uh, uh, low value. So, um, so when you have a group level phenomenon, you have uh, you have to you have a, a second a higher level of aggregation, which makes uh, inference harder. And a, a review of the of, uh, one of the the reports of the UK and the reports of the American uh, 
uh, experimental epidemiology and nature review that says that the, it's, it's clear that the amelioration or disappearance of an epidemic or epidemic infection is more often the result of the summation of effects, many of them unidentifiable and of any single uh, known factor. So complexity is what uh, came out. And uh, although, it, although um, when they were uh, um, talking about the, the end of the Ectromelia studies uh, in, 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 the, in the 1936 report, they said they were going to report many more things and it all it looked as though it was carrying on. Uh, none of the none of the um, future uh, things uh, appeared, and, and that work wound down in uh, the UK uh, in the, in, by, by, by 1940, which hits with the Second World War. I'm going to speak for just uh, briefly about the human work because the concepts that they arrived at will be the same. So when I get to the concepts, it will be the same. Um, the, the major player uh, here was the remarkable uh, Sheldon Dudley, who was a Navy uh, uh, doctor, chief medical uh, officer for the uh, Navy, but uh, uh, an extraordinary researcher. And he worked uh, on many infections, but like I focus on, I'll focus on diphtheria, which is one of the main things he worked on. Uh, and he, he did studies uh, in um, the Greenwich uh, uh, Royal. A hospital school, which was a, a naval school uh, where one could um, study uh, where, where one could where one could study the spread of, of, of diphtheria, often asymptomatically uh, measure it. There, there was now that by then it was possible to do chick tests and other tests to, to see if exposure had happened uh, or not. Measure the clinical disease. You could estimate the, the large extent to which there was subclinical disease such um, uh, in, the, in the population and look at how the uh, aggregate immunity level of the population influenced uh, when um, uh, the epidemics took off or not. Uh, and of course, the susceptibles were coming in every year with the uh, youngest, the youngest boys arriving. That was just a, another lot of susceptibles available for the diphtheria bacteria. And this is from uh, it's a pretty brilliant report. Uh, another MRC report similar to this one uh, on the human court that uh, and he, he titled the, the photo the human herd Greenwich Hospital schoolboys at dinner. Uh, and it was often said, um, it was often said that, uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's skipped to the wrong point. Oh, okay, I've, I've, I've lost it. Uh, it was often said that uh, in, in um, uh, Dudley's Royal Society of Victory, it was said that. This was raised in Parliament as an issue about uh, that, that uh, these uh, naval schoolboys were being used as, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a herd, you've been treated as a herd. But I've, I've looked hard through Hansard and you find something which is a little bit like that, but doesn't mention Dudley, doesn't actually mention the school. So I think it's been copied across again and again, uh, this, this thing, from, probably from the obituary, but I don't think it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was true. And here's Dudley, um, uh, one of the conclusions uh, from his work on working on, uh, on, on uh, many different uh, diseases uh, was this, that in endemic areas, the, uh, when an infection is ubiquitous, then it infects the infants and young children, causing the majority of subjects unapparent or very mild clinical infections, followed by specific immunity, which lasts throughout adult life. That's a, that is an infecting agent uh, is one which gives lifelong immunity or can be stimulated by repeat infection. That's when you have a, a, an endemic infection and therefore it's, it is not one that is often uh, producing uh, severe uh, ob uh, observed disease. But when, but when new infections arrive, freshly introduced uh, class of, uh, of uh, disease, the brunt of the epidemic falls on the adult members of the herd and the infants and the very young appear to be relatively non-susceptible. So this is, of course, reflects what uh, has been seen recently. But this was this was this was uh, from Dudley and Burnett was the um, model of how uh, of, of how you see how the difference between newly arriving in infections uh, where, where the population isn't uh, isn't used to them hasn't has not, hasn't had experience and endemic infections. And Dudley uh, did a 
reviewed to extraordinary length and was involved in some of studies of what are called virgin soil outbreaks, where you, the many out, the outbreaks you would have in populations that had not been exposed, like the influenza in uh, St Kilda in 1912 and uh, measles outbreaks, uh, like in Panama originally, I guess, in uh, the pharaohs, but in many places such measles outbreaks have been, have been observed and, and Fiji where you have sort of 30, uh, 20%, 30% mortality rate, these virgin soil epidemics. Uh, uh, and uh, they reason that this was just, just thinking about uh, the influences uh, 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 on immunity and uh, population susceptibility. Um, Fallen Burnett and Frank Fenner carried on. Uh, doing uh, experimental epidemiology VCTV in Australia, uh, actually through the first world, uh, sec through the Second World War, uh, the uh, the uh, the irony <laughs> was the main result of that was that uh, ECTV um, uh, spread. It was as we heard Greenwood and Co found it very difficult to stop the spread, and it got into uh, uh, US labs and it was banned. So uh, doing, doing research on ECTV was banned as opposed to smallpox. Uh, well, it, it was banned completely in the US, although that's been reversed. And uh, the, 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 hand, the couple of studies you could see, which might be called experimental epidemiology uh, in the last uh, 70, 60, 60 years, 70 years, have basically been done with, um, uh, but looking for how you can actually control uh, these for breeding mice for other reasons. So experimental epidemiology went away. So why did it disappear? Again, so historically people, it's conveniently said to be this was an interwar phenomenon. I think it's more likely that it just disappeared because of antibiotics and the perceived waning importance of infectious disease. So that, uh, the First World War coincided with the uh, flu pandemic this was now at getting to a stage where, as experimental epidemiology was going on, uh, what was the actual contribution of infection to mortality in the UK, US, Australia was falling. Uh, and of course, the antibiotics uh, introduced um, uh, to, uh, in, the, in the 1930s and then expanding in the 1940s led to the situation that these famous quotes we know, you know, the time from the Surgeon General in the US, this wasn't a meaningless quote, this is where the funding was going to go, the time to close the book on infectious disease and declare the war against pestilence won. Well, McFarlane Burnett himself uh, in 1951 uh, talking about diminishing importance of infectious diseases and the full use of knowledge we already possess, the effective control of every important infectious disease with the outstanding exception of poliomyelitis is possible. And so, and in an epidemiology, uh, attention uh, turned entirely to the uh, uh, non-transmissible um, non, non disease. This is a, I failed to animate this slide properly. This, this slide actually shows the uh, second wet life of the experimental epidemiology. Not that anyone did it, but the data from Greenwood uh, et al. Uh, that was, those are the data that we used in Anderson and May's seminal 1979 uh, paper on, um, on infectious disease modeling. And that's the quote from their paper, but uh, as I say, that's seminar two, it's going to be on models, so that's, this is the crossover point. So I'm going to finish by talking about the concepts that were developed uh, in, in these studies. So the first uh, concept was of herd immunity. Until I think the beginning of uh, the coronavirus period, uh, this was still was regularly said that uh, uh, Topley and Wilson um, uh, um, it came up with this and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and their, their 1923 paper on herd immunity, uh, oh, uh, their 1923 paper on herd immunity uh, in the title uh, in, uh, introduced it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Wilson uh, told uh, Paul Fine that he thought he'd first heard that, who uh, I think might be on the seminar, uh, uh, that he first heard the term um, uh, from Greenwood. Uh, and Greenwood, if he had heard it, was likely to have picked it up from the um, uh, agricultural field. Greenwood read everything and could understand every language. That's, well, that's set there. And um, uh, in, in, in the 1910s, there was uh, discussion of, um, of herd immunity and using the actual term herd immunity uh, when looking at abortion diseases in cattle. And it was, and 
uh, when you had this transmissible disease, did you slaughter the cattle or did you try to establish a herd which uh, we would now think would think of as obeying Burnett's law of, of uh, and, uh, 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 Burnett's law. Um, so, but if if now one reason that the, it's been very difficult to discuss herd immunity is because of the you know the name is seen to be uh, uh, as it sort of is that we treat people like herd and like Dudley was uh, you know criticised <coughs> for doing so. Uh, it's why herd and it's herd immunity because it came from cattle. So in a way, uh, maybe we could have a more sensible uh, discussion of this phenomenon, population immunity, let's call it. Uh, if indeed uh, Topley and Wilson had named it, because whilst the collective noun for a herd, for cattle, sorry, is herd, the collective noun for mice is mischief. So I'm gonna propose that we call herd immunity mischief immunity we just imagine that it had been called, <coughs> called mischief immunity rather than herd immunity. And uh, <coughs> this is uh, one of the ex-deans of the School of Hygiene. This is dean when I was uh, first went uh, um, from a, a, a really important paper on the prospects for control of infectious disease, uh, uh, looking at to, to see when um, uh, uh, you can re you reduce uh, uh, transmissions. And in that paper um, where, where, uh, that, where he, he introduced that, he started the paper by, with the important suggestion that the essential prerequisite of all good public health measures is that careful estimates should be made of their advantages and disadvantages for both the individual and the community, and that they should be implemented only when there is a significant uh, balance of advantage. But if we think of both herd immunity uh, or the um, mischief immunity or population immunity um, uh, in a situation where you have uh, both vaccination uh, and um, there is infection, uh, the, the important consideration is how, uh, is how best is that uh, resistance maintained? Is it ma best maintained entirely by vaccination? This is a discussion point, or is it best uh, to consider Burnett's law when considering uh, how that maintenance is carried out. So the second concept and issue that uh, Dudley discussed at length in the human study and Greenwood is packed into the, into the uh, I don't know, thousand pages or whatever it is of experimental epidemiology is this notion of how immunity waxes and wanes. So we saw uh, um, in some infections like uh, 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 ECTV, there's long, light, long lasting immunity in mice. In other infections, particularly in the bacterial, the bacterial infections they studied, it was much shorter. Uh, and they uh, developed this, the, the model they developed uh, uh, and uh, applied, it applied more or less in, in, to a different extent of different infections. The very specificity was one of the important uh, things that came out was that um, you had to have specific explanations for specific, specific diseases, there wasn't one overall explanation. The, um, uh, was that, uh, was that uh, um, um, the mouse would become infected, for many infections the immunity would wear off, but, but that they, um, uh, if, they had, if they survived the infection, and, and say some of these infections had high mortality rates, some lower, if they survived that infection, they would they'd be immune. They, if, they, if they encountered the infection again, uh, um, then that might become infected, carry and carry the, uh, the bug uh, and be able to spread it, but their immunity would be boosted. And this is what was seen in the uh, human challenge studies with coronaviruses and, uh, uh, and other viruses in the um, common cold unit in the MRC was that people, um, people were inoculated deliberately by K. Callow and others uh, with um, uh, coronavirus and, and infected. You could see if they'd already had antibodies, they would get less, uh, they would get less uh, symptoms. Uh, and then you re-inoculated them a year later, they would, they would uh, become infected, they'd carry virus and you could then get virus from them, uh, but they wouldn't be ill. So the notion here with the waxing and waning of immunity is that, is that once you have uh, immunity, then contact with uh, infection again, boosts, you, boosts that immunity. And that, that would be important for infections where immunity might wane in a year or so. 
And uh, here, the, the one the very important point, paper, I think, on how on thinking about this waxing and waning of immunity and how it's maintained is by Jenny Levine. Uh, and uh, um, um, Jenny's giving a seminar here for us on the 16th of March, uh, which I'd uh, recommend to uh, everyone. The third concept was virgin soil epidemics, which Dudley in particular uh, uh, discussed. So these are, these are settings where, um, where the population has very low, has low or no, has no immunity and the virus uh, uh, or other infection arrives. So I'm gonna, um, so, so one possibility is that you can uh, have virgin soils often thought of as isolated places that killed, et cetera, but it can be uh, any population where immunity falls to very low levels. Now, if you have infections where immunity falls in nine months, say, or a year, then, then there's possibilities that in those, especially if they're enclosed or, or they're you know, enclosed communities, that in those places, the infection, the, the protection falls to levels that are, are, are small. And that, and that then an infection which they haven't, hasn't been experienced, when that arrives, that, that has a virgin soil epidemic effect. And over the last uh, 25 years, there's a, there's a half dozen uh, reports from uh, long care stay facilities where there's suddenly been uh, uh, high mortality, which high mortality, which has been investigated because it's, it's, uh, you, you know, um, it's importantly high mortality. Uh, and then what, nothing would be found except seasonal coronavirus would be, uh, would be, would be found and, uh, and the people who died. Or and RSV in, in one, one, case, one or two cases. So, that, so one suggestion is that these situations are when the uh, elderly and highly susceptible uh, uh, often uh, uh, have other reasons for high susceptibility. When they are, are not exposed uh, or and are not vaccinated against the condition, obviously they're not with the seasonal coronaviruses. They, they, th th those populations just just by chance, by the sorts of things that Greenwood talked about. It just happens that no one's actually gone in with the, with, uh, with uh, each of the four seasonal coronaviruses that they become uh, 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 they become susceptible to such outbreaks of infection. Uh, they can wane, and this is what's happening with uh, seasonal coronaviruses in the U.S. Uh, we haven't there hasn't been the spike which would be expected every year, uh, except uh, NL63 has risen a bit. But usually you get one, you know, you get major uh, spikes every sort of couple of years. Each one will uh, will will rise, and so there will be you know continuing uh, re-exposure, and this will feed into the cyclicity um, uh, of immunity. RSV has also fallen to uh, low levels, so there's possibilities that, that what's uh, um, the one outcome uh, of um, uh, interventions will be that. Uh, susceptibility to serious response to other conditions uh, may increase. And you've got to remember that the, you know, the, the, best, the best done studies suggest basically that there's very little cross protection between within the groups of seasonal coronaviruses. There's none to small amounts of protection between one of these four types, let alone the notion of protection against uh, SARS-CoV-2, but it's the specificity um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the immunity. So the fourth concept uh, is mortuary selection. So um, herd immunity is not a very, isn't a popular term. I guess we're lucky that, that harvesting is, is difficult to discuss uh, harvesting, which is the notion that infection uh, selects the people at highest uh, risk, which is, which is what um, the uh, experimental epidemiology uh, studies uh, suggested, um, and uh, that this is this is green. Their conclusion was that selection by death of the more susceptible and natural immunization play a part in the increased average resistance displayed by the surviving mice. So there's uh, so so both are um, uh, contributing to that. Um, in the UK, uh, or England and Wales, sorry, in the first wave. Uh, if we look here, uh, blue is deaths from uh, uh, coronavirus. 
the brown is the excess deaths, not including COVID. Uh, and we see that there was actually a sort of lower, lower than expected deaths before COVID arrived, um, uh, which might have been because of high austerity related deaths uh, in a few, over the last uh, few years. Uh, but that, but that, but that uh, there was no, uh, there was no substantial uh, evidence of a selective effect. But now, in the in the second wave, there's now there is evidence that uh, excess deaths, not uh, not including COVID, are are negative, uh, and most importantly, they're not that that they're not changing uh, as the COVID related the direct. COVID deaths are going down. Of course, if they were misclassified COVID or some sort of misclassification, uh, the two would be uh, related. So that's um, just some um, evidence that, that some suggestion that that there is this is this is being uh, observed. There is some mortality displacement, uh, which as which as expected would be at the highest uh, risk uh, groups would display. And then the final uh, concept advanced by um, Dudley in particular was the notion of disease ecology, which is the notion that everything affects everything else. And it's not just everything one thinks of as biological affects everything else, it's things that are social uh, also will, will, will affect the biological and, uh, 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 and that the whole uh, uh, is dependent on uh, all parts of, of uh, of the system, and so you can't. If you just if you try to change one thing, uh, that, that that there might be consequences of that that aren't ones you think of, because changing one factor uh, will influence the uh, will influence the whole uh, disease ecology. And they, Dudley he wrote this rather brilliant paper on the ecological out, outlook of epidemiology, which is seen as a source of uh, uh, thinking in that in that way. Uh, and and he had we'd have many talks to, to say that in different situations, when 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 analysing different situations, it might be a different part of the ecology, uh, which is uh, is contributing to that, but producing the same outcome. But it's a bit, but you're doing that through perturbating a different uh, a different part of that uh, ecological uh, uh, whole. And he talks about about the sort of circulation factor of circulating humans, but also circulating uh, bugs, which will baffle all attempts to measure it, but is uh, clearly uh, uh, key. Uh, and um, that was the slide that should have been earlier. So that, <laughs> that was the one when I said that I couldn't find it. That was the totally being slagged off in the House of Lords, House of Commons. So uh, um, as I say, I hope this slide may give some grounds for uh, some basis for some discussion. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Julia, uh, uh, Meg and Caroline who for uh, many of the uh, slides. Uh, Danny uh, for the uh, uh, mortuary selection slides. Uh, and uh, I'd like to blame uh, Stephen Sen for me uh, doing this, uh, this, uh, for this two seminars because they are basically a reply to an email he, he sent me uh, early on in the COVID uh, days about uh, about uh, stochastic models. So this is uh, half of the answer to his email question. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, George. Do you want to stop sharing on screen? I will. Okay, uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. I'm going to go first to uh, Art Rheingold for a response. Art, you're muted at the moment, but if you have any first reactions or questions for George, fire away. So, George, first, uh, let me congratulate you um, on uh, be your interest in history. <laughs> um, not, not uh, we, we try and instill some of that in our students uh, to know about uh, you know the work of investigators a hundred years ago or more. Uh, I do think it's incredibly useful to, to look at what people accomplished then with sometimes very primitive uh, approaches, but learned enormous amounts. Uh, but, but clearly, um, as you pointed out, first of all, the, the conquest of infectious diseases that people uh, seem to, to believe had happened in the 60s and 70s of the last century uh, was not to be 
uh, and, and the current pandemic is just one good example of how infectious disease continues to be a, a problem that we haven't conquered. I know Professor Abi uh, will, will provide some interesting thoughts about um, perhaps broader immunity that might be developed in response to a particular infection or, or vaccine. But, but I think that the other piece that wasn't really uh, appreciated uh, by early investigators uh, is, is first of all, the extent to which different infectious agents really do uh, work quite differently, number one. So you, it's, it's conflating them all together, I think really creates confusion and, and is you know, fundamentally a misunderstanding of things. And, and second uh, is the evidence that acute infection um, not only uh, can, can make people ill or, 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 or kill them, but that chronic infection uh, also is potentially a very important issue uh, with regard to human health. And, and I don't think there was an appreciation for that issue either. Um, so, so I think the world is much more complicated uh, than early investigators thought it was, but, but we do stand on their shoulders and, and we frankly uh, would not be in the position we're in today to, to make additional advances had they not done this extraordinary work 100 years ago. So thank you for that. George, do you want to respond there? No, I'll, I'll uh, that's Peter. Okay. And then I'll, Peter, I'll... any first thoughts in reaction? I think he's muted. Good at the moment, if you were to come off mute. You have to un unmute yourself, Peter. It's down on the left, lower Thank left. You. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think. Maybe turn up the volume. Still not hearing you, Peter. Not quite sure what's going on there. It looks as if you should be able to speak to us, but we're simply not picking it I up. Hear you. It did for a minute or a second. <laughs> it's gonna go. Okay, all right. Um, I think we've got David Spiegelhalter who's uh, with us on the line. I'm not sure if we're able to go to him. I think probably we can. David, are you able to? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks like I looks like I can. It looks like I can certainly speak. Whether you can see me is another matter. Um, no. Yeah, can you see me? Anyway, it doesn't matter. No. I can't, but we can hear you. You could. That's fine. You could, if you can hear me, that's fine. Okay, George. Yeah, amazing stuff. And um, but of course, you know what I'm going to ask. I ask, what's the relevance? But what the mess we're in at the moment, or at least you know the the prospect for for uh, you know for the future about keeping this thing under control in some way. I mean, all everything you've described just emphasizes the enormous complexity of the issues and, uh, and that, you know, very simple calculations of herd immunity and so on really start looking very extremely naive. So um, I, I, I guess that's what I want to ask. I want you to, I want you to, to yeah. uh, be bold and say, oh. what are the implications for this for future policy for uh, controlling the pandemic? So, so, so I, I think there's, I think there's some uh, clear implications for what, for what we at least would want uh, to know to, to, to for, um, thinking about the, uh, about the future, which, which comes out of the um, thinking about the maintenance of immunity and the waxing and waning of immunity, which is something they studied uh, to, to such an extent and that was already you know, the major concern of the. Of the people uh, with the cattle uh, uh, in 1910, really, uh, uh, and it's to, it's to uh, think about the characteristics of the of, of the infection we have, and uh, how those characteristics fit um, with um, with 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 things you would you, things that you would do. Uh, uh, for something with, with those characteristics, if you like. So with ECTV, it gave you it gave the mice um, uh, very long-term immunity. 
uh, you, um, the vaccinated mice uh, who um, uh, were in colonies of um, mice who were stimulating their immunity in, in, in any case and carried on um, uh, doing very well. Um, but that's um, uh, that, 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 that's you know having their uh, compadres uh, who were helping the, the, their compadres who were stimulating their immunity weren't didn't get a very good deal um, uh, out of that. Um, but if you're, if, if you're in a, um, uh, a situation where you have, um, uh, where, where uh, you, you have shorter term immunity, one has to, one needs um, uh, other, other considerations. And we don't know uh, how long uh, vaccine induced uh, immunity Will be. I mean, we certainly we that I think we have. I, th I think we have quite strong pointers to the fact that it is not anything. It's not is not going to be a lifetime. Uh, and you know, people who've been vaccinated uh, 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 can certainly carry uh, can, uh, can transmit, etc. Um, if 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 the if vaccine induced immunity is um, uh, is 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 relatively uh, short-lived um, then you've got to then you'd be then the uh, implications are you either go down a route uh, which involves uh, you know, annual vaccinations uh, and you go to annual vaccinations and vaccinations which change along with the um, changing of the strain because I talked about how um, uh, how um, much of the how uh, focus experimental epidemiology was on the fact that the epidemics were largely influenced by the immune status of the of the herd uh, and um, the, each individual epidemic not by the change but they recognized that between epidemics there, there could be strain changes uh, and one thing that was they was discussed uh, certainly by uh, Dudley uh, and um, and um, Burnett um, was the notion that uh, if there is such change then the change will, will generally not be uh, you know, dramatic to, uh, to, to, to an agent which, for which there's no longer any um, uh, cross protection. Um, so it wouldn't be like uh, in our current situation, you're gonna get a change to something which is as different as any of the two of our four seasonal coronaviruses we know. Uh, uh, it's not as though it's going to, if, if that if we if we get that then it might be a reintroduction or something or that would be a sort of um, unexpected. Um, is that is that with uh, natural immunity as as the as the agent uh, changes then then that helps shape the, um, uh, the the degree to which the the immunity uh, protects and as it changes a bit the, so 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 you don't get so you don't get, so you don't get. Um, a, a disastrous outcome. Um, now, so there's a possibility, one possibility is that uh, one tries to uh, defeat, you know, win by just manufacturing a different vaccine every year and that you get high enough vaccine uh, coverage that uh, is, is, is protective uh, and, and doesn't leave uh, enough circulating and doesn't leave circulating virus, which will uh, put at risk all of those who, for whatever reason, don't get vaccinated, don't want to be vaccinated, etc. And you have, uh, and um, as I think everyone accepts that this is endemic on a world scale, uh, you have border uh, closures, uh, you, you, you police your borders to, to allow no uh, introduction, um, then that's but then that's uh, one route to go. Uh, a, a second uh, route would be to think of vaccinating the high, the uh, high risk, uh, and continuing to vaccinate the high risk. But whilst you might initially start off vac uh, vaccinating uh, children, uh, to think about whether that is a whether that sh should be uh, uh, continued. Um, I mean, I, th I think these are these are things where we, we you know we need. We need more data, and what I, one could get, one could put it together a list of what the data are we need. But you certainly need uh, more data to answer 
uh, those questions. Uh, those questions. George, it, George, it looks like Professor Abi is back on, and I'm sure he has something right. to say. But just to point out that uh, we we do have a session tomorrow evening. Yeah. Uh, we will talk about whether the world can achieve zero COVID or yeah. not, and and address some of these issues if we can advertise that. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, BMJ IEU webinar on zero COVID, uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. And Art is going to start off by uh, by uh, going through the uh, background to uh, classical notions of infectious disease control. Okay, thanks. Um, Peter, do you want to try again? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, still, still no luck. Okay, I think we have Alison Pollock there. Um, Alison, do you want to unmute? Uh, she has a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. That was fantastic, George. And you probably answered one of them in part. So my big question was, given Burnett's law and what we know so far about this not being a serious disease in children and even young adults, should we even be considering vaccinating them at all? And should we be learning more to live with the vaccine, as you say, and just vaccinate high risk groups? So I think you've answered it in part, but if you want to expand a bit more on the children, that would be great. Yeah, so 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 I, I, I think amongst the unknowns that we that we need we need to know about uh, are um, uh, what are the consequences in children? I think what I think we, we do know enough about to say is that the consequences for mortality in children are low and is lower mortality than for uh, other diseases which um, uh, circulate. Uh, I mean, in the kid, in children, the, 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 in that terms, it looks like a seasonal uh, coronavirus uh, uh, sort of response, but there's, there is, there are the possibility, there are the uh, post uh, COVID conditions that exist and we need uh, proper, we, 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 we vitally need, I think, uh, proper prospective data with uh, with um, objective data uh, collection and with control groups cor correctly chosen uh, to uh, to get evidence on that. I think that's that's one of the most vital questions there are because uh, that would that those data could lead to different answers to that question. I mean, if it if it turns out that there are very that there are common serious long term sequelae, then then that would uh, that would obviously um, favour continued vaccination, but, but considering all the uh, problems with it, uh, if there if there weren't, then 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 as you say, there could be the, the consideration of just of vaccinating above a certain age, uh, uh, above the age of people who who get um, serious disease. But but we need to know about the sort of post COVID uh, conditions in 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 all groups. I think that's essential. But I think we shouldn't. I think we shouldn't go down one route without uh, without actually trying to objectively put what what sort of information we need and uh, uh, and and, real, and focus on that being the information we collect. Thanks. Can I ask a second question, Art, or have I used up my time? Yeah, we move on, Alison. We've got a long queue and not much time. If that's <laughs> all right, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> Um, I was just check in with Danny Dawling, who had a question in the Q and A, which was also about the wisdom of, in, of trying to reduce um, infection within children. Was that wise? I think we've touched on that. Danny, is there another point you wanted to raise? Yes, I'll put another question up. Um, is there any other infectious disease which is quite so influenced by age in terms of the threat it poses? And if there is, how do we deal with that disease? Okay. Um, so the, the 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 disease which is closest to it uh, in, in, in some ways is the uh, 1889 influenza epidemic, which uh, has, of course people have proposed might have been a revival of one of the seasonal coronaviruses, which uh, we can get data from about seven places now where it has had an extraordinary skewed um, age. Uh, um, age um, uh, distribution, um, uh, um, but in, but in terms of uh, other diseases, I I, I mean uh, seasonal influenza, uh, it, it, you know, is, is very sharply age uh, 
age-dependent, um, I think maybe not quite as sharply age-dependent as looking at um, uh, mortality. Uh, and can, I mean, of course, can, as, especially with a new, uh, you, know, as, you know, can have um, mortality as seen in, in children. Um, so, uh, so I mean, that, I mean, and that's an interesting point because in, uh, I mean, in um, Britain, uh, there's not sort of all age influenza um, vaccination, but in the States, you can get vaccination at any age and some people start, you know, been getting vaccinated. I mean, maybe Art would know better about, would know better than I do about, about that and would have a better answer to Danny's question, maybe. The age distribution compared to other. Well, virtually every infectious disease disproportionately affects different age groups. Um, I can't think of it. I mean, I suppose in a virgin soil epidemic, uh, you can see a uh, uniform rates of infection and maybe morbidity and mortality. But for, for the most part, we see very distinct age patterns. You know, j just going back, and, and I'm hoping Dr. Abi can join us. I'm not sure if he <laughs> it finally found his voice. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I would say that, that um, there, you know, there could be several reasons why you'd want to vaccinate children against the COVID-19 virus. One, obviously, is the question of whether there's enough serious illness or long-term sequelae to make that worth doing to protect those children. Um, but, but, you know, there are some infections where we vaccinate young children in hopes of protecting them when they get older. Uh, hepatitis B is a good example of that. Um, and, and, you know, of course, the question is, is the immunity durable uh, going into 15, 20, 30 years later. Um, so you might want to vaccinate children if you think that the immunity will protect them when they get older. And then the other reason would be if they're contributing to a lot of transmission within the community to adults, uh, you might want to vaccinate them to reduce, uh, you know, there their being sources of infection for others. So, so I think there could be several reasons why you might want to do that. Um, Thank you. We've got a couple of questions, George, asking about the effect on other um, infectious diseases. Um, what are the likely impacts on other viruses that have been suppressed? And uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so the so the other viruses being suppressed is what I was saying about your seasonal uh, coronaviruses is. Um, if you have things which uh, are are basically maintained as uh, endemic uh, diseases, do you have a do, do you have a problem with the fact that you're um, uh, that they're going to they're disappearing for a while, and, and uh, uh, it could very well be there isn't, but um, uh, it, that's just one thing that uh, should be thought uh, that should be should be thought about. And I'm going to try very briefly, it's nearly half past, just to see if David Colquhoun, who is there with a, a point to make. I think, David, can you join us? Yes, yes. Ah, no, no video, but never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps it's just as well. Um, one, one thing I'd really like to know is the, what the contents of the letter from Stephen Sen were. Have you published that? Because No email. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've, no, I've known him for a long time since he was at UCL. And, He's been uh, very helpful recently in his slightly combative way in the, in uh, in sort Stephen's, of on, Stephen's on because Stephen Stephen might so Stephen asked me whether uh, I thought that uh, a, a sort of a problem in the um, in the in the sort of the, the modelling response, if you like, was uh, um, uh, was the fact that uh, stochastic models, although they've been sort of uh, introduced, uh, uh, had had uh, not uh, had the uh, you know had the major impact on um, you know on on actual uh, practice uh, by the Bartlett and uh, others had developed and, uh, and and pushed these that um, most of the modelling um, exercises one saw were deterministic models. That was his that was his question. Stephen's here, so if he's got, he's he's got Stephen's very busily engaging in discussion on the chat with. Uh, <laughs> David, David Stevenholter and uh, age dependent effects of, of uh, so do do catch it if you, if you get a moment. Stephen's here, yeah. 
He is here. He's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm not quite. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why George thinks I'm responsible for starting any of this. <laughs> I just noticed that I think David Spiegelhalter had a very interesting take on the age effect, in which he described it in being. Um, you, you could look at it in terms of the extra years of life of risk that you would have, and of course yeah. that risk is much more important if you're old than if you're young, and. Uh, on that scale, I think there is no age effect. This just translates into um, translates into a, a practical difference, which is enormous. I wonder if it tells us something about how and why the disease is dangerous. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, David, David here could could answer that. I mean, the, the, uh, just say that. I mean, it's a it is a it's a very interesting, you know, it's extremely interesting observation, and uh, you could, you know, I mean, uh, uh, David talked about it in, like in terms of. You've had like an extra. You've had like an extra year added onto your uh, clock without having uh, actually had the uh, pleasure of um, yes. li living <laughs> that's, it. And, and, that's right. Yes. <laughs> and, it, uh, and, it, and you know, and, it, and it, that that sort of might arise by the fact that whilst you're actually you know infected, you have you know, you know very high mortality for a few weeks, which together adds up to the adds up to the equivalent of a uh, of a year uh, and. Um, whilst that, whilst it seems to be, whilst it, it's a, it's a as a general rule of thumb, it looks uh, very good and it looks as though it's standing up uh, very well. Uh, um, it's it, it's it's probably not your overall mortality risk. If, if you think maybe it's mortality risk minus accidents and violence, and mm -hmm. rather oddly, uh, your uh, mortality elevation because you're a smoker doesn't seem to translate into. Uh, the increased uh, COVID risk. Have, have you got anything to anything more on the your um, multiplicative on 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 the on that, David? Well, I just that yeah, you're right that smoking doesn't translate, but most other things do. Yeah. And so if you know there was this previous question, well, do you know any other disease that has the sort of age pattern that COVID does? And I'd say the disease of life has, <laughs> the, has the same <laughs> age weird. distribution of, of mortality. Well, that's that, I, I wish I know you could see me flaying around coming up with 1889 influenza and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's the disease of life. That's that was the answer. I'll, I'll I'll go back in and in the recording. I'll splice me giving that answer as the. Uh... <laughs> well, I'm frankly not sure that's a perfect analogy either, as the infant mortality is quite high, um, in in life, uh, compared to mortality in children, you know, above the age of two. Yeah, I should say from, from above the age of ten. I should say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> George, it's after half past. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I don't know if we should stop promptly or do you want to carry on for a few more minutes if people are willing to stay online we should probably if, if people have uh, it's a shame we didn't you know, peter I'm, I'm i'm desperate to hear what peter has to say but we but, but i'll uh, I'll, I'll, sp I'll speak to you offline peter. okay <laughs> you haven't right. said anything michael I haven't said it. I did have one very quickly, George. Um, this point about the, uh, when you study an epidemic, you study one epidemic, however many hundreds of thousands of mice there are in it. Um, how many units have we got now to study? I'm just curious. Are we looking at the nation state? Is that one epidemic? Is it a glo one global pandemic? Have we got several pandemics running within the UK? Well, how do we assess it? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a, a really uh, uh, interesting point. What is the sort of... Um, Level, level of aggregation. Uh, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, Britain's been world leading on is um, uh, it's obviously randomized trials. They've done brilliantly, We're, uh, wasting money on test and trace. They've done, they're, they're world leading at wasting money on. <laughs> and, um, uh, but the other is the sequence, is, is sequencing. And, uh, and in a way, it's sort of, uh, it, Although this is, the, I'll now say what well, you don't have to listen to the, you don't have to come to the next seminar, the one on models. But uh, uh, the, the the sort of the the point there is that the, the sort of sequence data, in a way, sort of validate the um, stochastic models. And to, even though, of course, you've only got a sample of the, all, of all the infections, and there's lots and lots of ways in which that sampling can uh, distort things. But though, is it is it is it you know? It seems that each lineage. Either, but basically, uh, as this uh, sort of stochastic notion for a lineage would propose, 
is that um, they die out quickly because, uh, you know, by chance or what, by some reason, uh, it doesn't get, uh, they don't get there transmitted to their three or four in the, in the virgin soil case, however many, the R0 the R case, however many they're meant to uh, uh, transmit to and they just die out. Or of course, if they carry, if they've carried on and they've got to quite a lot of people, they're never going to, they're not going to just die out by uh, chance anymore. And so you, and so you, and so the lineages you actually get are either very small, you know, one or singletons, or one or two or three, or they're thirty or more. And it's a be they're beautiful in the paper, the science paper, from those uh, data. So you could say, in a in a way, you could say that what we've got the number of epidemics we've got is those is, uh, each. Uh, you know, would would be that um, separate lineage, and that's actually what you want. You, if you could get the aggregation at that level, you could say, you know, uh, how you know how you know uh, how large if there was just that introduction uh, would, think, would 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 things go, uh, and, and at what stage you know can you just uh, just uh, you know stop the whole thing? So, um, uh, but but it's it, it's yeah, it's it, it, it's the, the the aggregation question is. It's clearly it's a it's a, a major issue for making interpretation and trying to learn things from one situation, uh, but but you have to think about what's the appropriate level of aggregation. Okay, thanks very much indeed. I'm I'm not sure. Um, gloomy prospect. Just I can understand why people think of this as a gloomy prospect, but it's a fascinating one either way. And I think um, I, I know Topley and others were depressed by the outcome of some of their experiments, but. Um, they seem pretty constructive to me. Thanks very much indeed, George. And thanks to everybody for taking part. Sorry if we didn't get around to your question. Thanks to those who did. Particularly apologies to Peter that we couldn't yeah. right <laughs> here. Um, I hope we get another opportunity. And the details <laughs> will be available about the next one very shortly. Thanks very much indeed, everybody. And, and remember, to, and tomorrow, the, uh, the uh, zero COVID. And uh, there will be a recording uh, uh, of this, hopefully, as they're live. Thanks, Michael. Thanks all. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Good Peter. Morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Stephen and David. <laughs>